Aries 9, a crystal gazer. Somebody's looking at a crystal ball, and it is thought that by looking at a crystal ball, you're able to see the future. The capacity to see the future is, is rather controversial, isn't it? There are aspects of the future that must be, and there are aspects of the future that may be. And we can see what must be. It's, it's more or less common sense in the a sense of developing correct perceptions of patterns and flowings of things. When we're considering the other aspect of things, that which is normally not subject to prediction, we enter a very interesting field of philosophy in a sense. Because most assuredly, some of us can see the future. I, I've, I've had a sight of, of the future several times in my life, but not so much a sight, just a, a, a predictive feeling. Um, I say several times, it's actually much more frequently than that. And I'm not alone in this, I'm not that special. It's just that when you actually are willing to trust the subtle mind, you, you, you tune into something which is generally available to everyone, but they just don't choose to tune into it. And they actually sometimes don't believe what they've seen. Um, so I think there is this capacity we do have to know what is coming in the future. But whether that knowing is reading something which already exists and we haven't yet arrived at, which is a passive relationship to it on the one hand, or actually creating it by imagining it on the other. And I don't think we can know. I don't think those two things are different from one another in essence. I think when it comes out into the world, it changes its direction. One is out and the other is in, concave and convex attitudes to the question of perception. So um, we're reminded, for example, of quite a lot of um, mythological stories where there's a hero that has the, um, the task of rescuing his community from danger, and he sets out on a journey in order to take on a monster or something. And before he goes, he always, almost always, consults the oracle. And he goes to typically a woman who is very mysterious and Scorpio-like or Pisces-like and watery anyway. And, and she creates this mood, this, this sensitive mood of, of, of like, oh, wow, you know, this mysterious number seven kind of mood with her glamour. And, and gives the confidence that the hero wants that her words are meaningful by that glamour. And that's a workable process that, that you can use, even if you can't see the future. But sometimes that triggers us into a knowledge of, of what is coming, that very process of opening up the, the, the subtle mind, tearing away the veil that grossifies the world, makes it gross and material. If we take that veil away and we look beneath the surface of things, to read beneath, but between the spaces of, of information that we have, we can somehow feel the atmosphere and the flow of that atmosphere, which has an inevitable consequence. And if you learn how to do that by practicing tarot cards or rune stones or whatever you want to use, you can develop the ability of the subtle mind to, to read the, the flow of things and to know that what is inevitable must happen. That's something that we can train ourselves to do. The, the higher facility of being able to read a particular future, uh, such as is available to psychics, um, this is a different process and um, it depends upon being able to move your consciousness up to the level of, of what is called the muse or spirit of inspiration or you could call them your angels or, or spirit guides whether it's yourself at a higher level or another person talking you to you in, 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 a, in a realm beyond this one is secondary it's not really that important that we know now to move yourself into that realm of being 
it, it, it means that you have to have less of a commitment to this realm of being. And the people that have done this particularly well over the, the centuries, um, they tend to be unworldly. And the best example that we can think of is Elsie Wheeler herself. She was the person who first saw the Sabian symbols. And she was not a worldly person. She, she could not function in the world. She was living in a wheelchair. She, she did not have this worldliness that actually stops us from being otherworldly. So to develop your psychic ability using a crystal ball, for example, or all of these other techniques that are available, it does mean that you need to give up some of your aspirations in the normal world and um, not everyone is willing to do that it, it's a big price to pay there's a lot more understanding in today's world about the relationship between the observer and the observed on a physics level we can decide whether to see light as particle or wave according to which experiment we line up but we can't actually see them as both. It depends upon our expectations to, to get the result that we're expecting. Now this is true in life itself. Every, every situation has to be interpreted. We, we see the facts of the matter with our sensory apparatus, but we have to make, make up a meaning of what's going on. And it's extraordinary how so many people see different things when we're all looking at the same thing. I'll take a simple example when your team is playing another team, the Reds and the Blues want to discuss whose throw-in it is, and you will see it to your advantage because that's what you want. So desire changes our acuity of perception. If we're locked into an emotional need, we can't see clearly. If you want to see clearly, and predict the future, which is not your choice of the future, just see what there might be, then you have to move out of the realm of caring. You can't have an angle. You can't want something and predict whether it will occur. It's just the wrong energy. You need to be indifferent to outcomes in order to be able to see clearly. And this is true in the moment as well as in the future, as it were. It trains us, therefore, when we actually learn this technique of crystal gazing. It trains us to be indifferent to the current situation. And the, um, the fact is that we don't know whether an event is helpful for us or not in the moment. We just don't know. We can't tell. So many things can take place to turn bad news into good news and good news into bad news that we just can't tell in the moment whether an event supports our longer-term vision and our soul's requirement. We have no way of knowing. If we're attached to an expected outcome, then we can't perceive it properly. So one of the deepest teachings within any spiritual tradition is indifference. And this is hard to reconcile with normal community interaction. If somebody comes to you and they say, oh, I've had this terrible piece of bad news, and, and actually you're authentically indifferent to them, they, they don't like it. You know, they want your pity and, and sympathy. So it's quite difficult to, to remain uncaring about events. Somebody dies, it's just like, well, so what? They're going to a better place. It, it's their time. It, 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 it doesn't matter. It's of no consequence. Well, you can't say that one, that comment. You can't tell a grieving person that it just, it's nothing. You know, they, they don't want that. They want sympathy. So the whole business of becoming uncaring, indifferent, and above it all, in order that you can see the future and actually see the present, um, it, it's a difficult one. It's a real challenge for a spiritual seeker to do that. But when you can do that, when you can learn indifference, which meditation really, really helps with, the Zen Buddhist has done a huge amount of meditation and has absolutely no interest in whether they're 
living or dead. They, it doesn't make a lot of difference. They die and they continue meditating in the same way. It's, it's, there's nothing, no consequence to them. And the Sufis are a little bit like that too, I think. You know, they, they teach that death uh, leads us to a, a world so much nicer than this one. It, it's, it's hard to stop oneself from desiring that to come quicker. So we become a bit indifferent to, to what happens, not knowing that um, whether the future is better or worse because of that event. And the crystal gazer is, is really training themselves in indifference rather than being able to predict the future, I, I, I would say. What's, what's, what's the purpose of knowing the future anyway? What's the advantage in that? I, I, I can't see it.